Um, I, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Joel and Daniela, both architecture uh, graduate students at Georgia Tech. Um, uh, I've appointed them to run through uh, the work that we did in our drone port group. Um, I think if I put my old um, economist hat on, I think what is absolutely critical if this technology develops is that uh, communities uh, get to benefit from it economically and not just that value uh, goes upstream to Shenzhen or Silicon Valley. Um, so in other words, that uh, a drone port might uh, deserve to be slightly messier than one would uh, expect it to be, but obviously safe and secure. Um, I think it right now is best to let Joel and Daniela run through the work we did, and then I might probe them with a couple of questions and hope that the audience uh, would do that uh, as well. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Wow, it's been a tough morning, right? Uh, my name is Joel Jesu. Um, I grew up on the other side of the lake uh, in Kampala, and I've been in the field of architecture now for uh, about seven years. Um, and so very delighted to be here uh, and just be a part of this initiative that uh, I personally believe uh, will set us up to kind of begin talking about certain things that would fundamentally change uh, how African communities actually will work. And my colleague, I'm Daniela Marquez. I have been in the field of design and architecture for the last six to seven years. Um, and I've also been very interested in what it can do and impact and how it can impact communities such as today. Um, do we have that? Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the hosts. Uh, here in Tanzania. This is my first time to be uh, in Tanzania and I tell you I feel like I'm home. Uh, the hosts have been so gracious and so attentive to us and I'm very very thankful uh, to, to all of you. I'd also love to thank uh, Area Futures. Um, they've done such a fundamental job uh, to get this kind of workshop going and I'm very very uh, delighted to be part of that team. I'm also very thankful for the infrastructure team. If you guys can just take a minute and stand up if you're in the infrastructure team that worked so hard yesterday, the whole day. Can you, you all please stand up, please? Thank you. It's, um, and just so you know, we stayed up until uh, 4 a.m. this morning, again, trying to reinforce these ideas so that we can uh, hopefully deliver some good conversation to spark some, some questions. Well, while the technology is, uh, is loading, I'd love to uh, start by saying, uh, when we talk about drone ports, I think we can spend a lot of time talking about the logistics, the technology, what kind of drone, what kind of problems it's going to solve. But I also think from a design standpoint and from an architecture uh, standpoint, that we stand at the hallmark here in this room to set up a new typology of civic places in Africa, right? And I'll give you an example. Um, as a community, growing up in an African community, I did not experience what it meant to be in a civic place. In fact, the most common gathering place was when you went and played football with your friends, right? That was the community space. Uh, the other community space would be a school. Right? And so if you had a community meeting, you went to a primary school or a secondary school. The other community place that I think could be really close is a church. Right? And so you went to a church uh, and had either community meeting or worship gathering. But I also do think um, that the drone board itself could really be a good way for us to think about community spaces and a new typology that would help communities come together um, and create a new civic space. So what is a drone port, right? Um, in our workshop yesterday, we discovered some new things. 
And uh, if, when all of you were coming to Mwanza, you did not tell or you know, book your airline ticket or your bus ticket and said, I'm going to a building at Malaika, right? You said you're going to Mwanza. So Mwanza is a place. Mwanza is not a building. Mwanza is not a street. Uh, Mwanza is, is a place. And because it's a place, it carries the weight and why Mwanza is special, right? And so we think that a drone port is not an object, right? And uh, for all our discussions that we've seen is that the drone port is this thing where drones go and land and you, know, you have all your logistics solved, right? So a drone port is not an object. A drone port is also not a building, right? And I would challenge us this morning to think about a drone port as a place. Because the moment it becomes a place, then it becomes a place where people go to, it becomes a civic place, it becomes a place where people in the community actually look forward to go and see this new technology. In fact, for that matter, it is something that now the community begins to embrace, not as some man's invention, but as something that has really come to be, be realized from a grassroots effort and from a real place that they live in. So what are some of the core values for a drone port? In fact, yesterday we came to uh, uh, some sort of debate about whether the word drone port is the most appropriate thing to actually describe these things that we are talking about. In fact, I think we are talking about a bigger conversation about what we want to create in the 21st century for an African community more than we are actually talking about a drone port itself. And so I would encourage us this morning to actually challenge that theory of calling it a drone port because then we are going to narrow it down to an object or a building. So it must be super local. You know, yesterday when we went to uh, the island, um, we, we, we were able to observe local materials. But most importantly, when it comes to it being local, it must be something that is designed and informed by the people who are going to use it. And I, I tell you, I've, I've, I've had a, an opportunity to work on projects between the United States and Uganda for about seven years now. And I tell you, I cannot tell you how many projects we've done. And as soon as you get on the plane, you went with your project, right? And then you come back one year later, and there's nothing that has happened to whatever you spend a lot of energy and money doing. And the secret is that as individuals sitting in this room, we must learn the art of empathy. Empathy to me is the most important thing that we are going to use to design these places for people here in Africa. Because when we engage empathy and then we, began, we begin to find people where they are and be quick to not solve problems, but be quick to engage them and seek ideas and thoughts from them to change their own communities. Uh, it must be able to have uh, low carbon emissions. So when it comes to uh, absorbing energy and creating energy, it, it must be something that produces its own energy, and that energy being uh, clean energy. It must be flexible. You know, over time, uh, for anything to have an impact, it must be flexible. It's going to change. Uh, it's going to evolve differently. Uh, people are going to take on the skills that you teach them during the prototype typing phase, and they're going to transform those skills to make their own ways of construction. And so it's going to change. It's going to be something that is ever evolving. And it must be civic. Uh, I shared a little bit about that, that it must be a place where we look forward to go. It cannot be an object. I cannot stress that enough because it just can't be an object or a building. And it must be something that is iconic. Uh, one of the things that I really love about the Norman Foster image, it is something that is iconic, right? It is something that the community will be proud of. It's a place that people will go and tell stories. In fact, I look forward to people and a, 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 a boat route being created here in Mwanza to go to Juma because there's such an iconic place in Juma Island that will bring people from all over the world to experience the impact of that place. So it must be iconic. 
It must be something that when you fly over Juma Islands at night, you can see the light beaconing out of this small island that no one actually knows. So getting a little bit to more, what is the program of a drone port? Right now, um, we have established that drone port in its name says that it has to involve drones, but we've also touched a lot more on what it can be um, than that. So we have come up with two core programming ideas, the main one being a drone core uh, as a volumetric thing and a civic space as a volumetric thing. You can't have one without the other when you create a drone port. Uh, for it to be successful. Um, so kind of thinking about this program, we established that a civic space alone could bring interest, kind of what Joel has been saying, to the community when it has not been established yet. But a drone port in combination with it can bring a lot of new opportunities, both in terms of economic growth, it could bring new opportunities in terms of services available, community involvement, but also expanding the local infrastructure to a more regional infrastructure. So when we look at more a little bit at the diagrams that we have explored, you'll see that we're exploring a lot of this in really abstract terms, something that does not have a very defined shape of not very defined design intentionally because that cannot be found until we explore it with the local communities. This is a typology and a framework that could be used anywhere and then defined and refined based on where it is. So this framework could work as easily on Juma as it could work in Mwanza, as it could work in Ukerewe, as it could work in any other region of Lake Victoria. It's amazing what you guys have achieved, um, taking that vision. And I actually think the zipline model has a lot of validity for the global uh, uh, emergency health delivery space. I'm not sure um, it has as much uh, validity for commercial cargo in in the African context, in terms of smaller communities being able to exchange goods and services, which we probably can't even imagine what they are. Um, I, when I originally started thinking about these things, I was thinking about red lines for medical and blue lines for cargo. So I think when we talk about the typology of what a drone port is, we're essentially talking about a, a, a kind of blue cargo commercial line. Um, in terms of just to be a little bit specific about what we imagine for Lake Victoria and where we're going with the challenge, I think next year we want to see about building a relatively large structure in or approximate to Mwanza, which has a digital fabrication unit in it, and uh, different drone teams will come and fly in segregated airspace. Um, and and then we can imagine an Ukarewe Island, a sort of medium scale uh, drone port, which also has some digital fabrication. And then what we imagine on Juma is the sort of end game a drone port. But really interestingly there in the community, um, we can already see some potential business models, assuming, of course, which is an enormous assumption, that uh, propulsion systems of drones really do uh, improve. Um, uh, my, my personal view is that we need to get to minimum eight kilo payloads um, and, and obviously all of the safety and security that government requires. If we did that, even uh, for Juma Island, which is a relatively poor community, you can imagine that fish products um, can be semi-processed on the island and flown back to Mwanza um, with a lot of value being withheld uh, within the community, uh, value which is lost at the moment. And uh, Africa is the sort of king of the middleman business, um, where uh, a middleman businessman uh, exerts a high degree of arbitrage over relatively poor uh, people who are producing primary products. And I do think that cargo drones and drone ports if they do massively scale, will actually cut uh, some of the middleman's uh, economic uh, space out. Um, are we ready with the slides yet? No? Uh, it's problematic. Uh, maybe I'll just um, uh, interview Joel and Daniela. If someone gives me a microphone. Um, 
uh, can you just run us through uh, what you think the, the essential points of the typology of a drone port should be and why you think it should be a drone port and not a warehouse? Um, I definitely think that the, uh, the civic um, element of the drone port to me is the most fundamental thing about the drone port. Uh, because if, if it's a place that the community feels like they can go, if it's a place that they feel has a civic presence, then it's something that will support any other service that will go into uh, the drone port. Uh, can, we, can we imagine what the drone port in Juma might look like when we build it next year? So in our discussions and our breakout group yesterday, we talked a lot about what could make the Juma drone port unique to Juma. And a lot of things that we observed were kind of the existing day-to-day uh, -day living. Uh, that's something we talked about with Ben, that there's a very important fishing culture and community established. So the drone port in Juma, to be unique to Juma, would have to incorporate some sort of element in regard to that sort of fishing culture, whether it be an introduction to um, a, a weighing uh, station for their fish, for them to them, potentially in the future when the drone ports um, or the drones themselves can carry larger quantities of weight to then, you know, ferry over through the drones to Mwanza in the fishing market. So. Um, I, I think it's important also to think about the drone port having this digital fabrication element. Um, so you have those three functions of safe, secure drone operations, um, digital fabrication, uh, which is essentially a garage. Um, uh, if you think about early petrol stations, you know, you, you filled up and your car is repaired there. Um, and, then, and then the community element. I'm really hoping these slides uh, are going to work now. Are they they're okay? Thanks, thanks so much. So as kind of what we were talking about, the drone port requirements, one of the main ones was a secure landing. And this is something that we would have to work in collaboration with all of the people talking here about their drone designs and the manufacturing process. But also, this would also uh, be established by kind of the authorities and policies established around the idea of drone aviation around the island and around the region. It would have to function for the operations of drones. So what would that mean? That would mean the drone has to be able to land and take off. It has to be able to be potentially stored. Batteries would have to be recharged. Um, what happens if there is an emergency weather situation? Is there enough available room to kind of take refuge in the drone port? We'd also be looking at then at parking. Would it be something that only happens in emergencies? Or would there be a permanent five or 10 drones housed in the Juma Island location, for instance, versus a larger island where it could be 10 to 15. And then maintenance. So what happens when these drones will need maintenance? Is there some facility available at the drone port that could offer these services without having to figure out how to get them back to a potentially larger drone port of Mwanza? And then fabrication. Would the people of the islands potentially be able to fabricate their own repairs? We talked a lot about 3D printing um, and the sort of technology that could be embedded, kind of um, you know, a maker space to say, uh, that could maybe start really low tech and then expand to uh, larger, more complex technologies like we've heard about plasma cutting, laser cutting, 3D printing, and 3D uh, digital software. And then energy, this has to have a component of energy. If you are to charge all these batteries, if you are to run all these fabrication equipment, there has to be a level of clean energy. Right now, the only energy source that we saw on the island, since it's off the grid, is solar energy. But what, what other methods could there be opportunities for um, to create the energy that would be required to run a drone port? And then con connectivity. So where the, that means radio signal, the drone ports must be connected because a lot of the drones that we've been hearing about are based on signal. So there has to be a level of dispatch, but also retrieval of the drones that is embedded. So that maybe might mean a tower. We don't know. That could be expanded upon with the conversation of what, what would these drones really need moving forward. 
And then last but not least, this needs to have a level of visibility within the community. Invest, um, inserting a drone port without allowing the community to really understand how it works, what it does, is very difficult um, to then create a lasting impact or even an interest of how to attain the knowledge to operate some of these drones locally. So a level of visibility while maintaining a safe you know, perimeter um, is really important and we'll touch a little bit more on how we could accomplish that through materiality. As far as for our civic space, we thought it was really important that it starts off being women-centric. Joel can touch a little bit more on this as to why it's so key to do that in the region. See, as a young child, um, when I lost my dad, I was raised by a single mom. And uh, one of the things that I came to realize that the anchor of any African community lies within the hands of women and children. Uh, and in fact, just to put this in context, yesterday when we went to Juma Islands, there was no teacher that we met at the only primary school on Juma Island. In fact, we asked where are the women and said, no, we do not have any women's stuff at the school. That says a million words about the power of what this civic place, if it's very intentional to target the core uh, part of the community and that of the children and the women, how successful that can be. And so I think that's something that uh, we need to leverage uh, and get the women on board and get the children on board. In fact, one way to test the success of a drone port is if you have a football pitch that is well leveled with good grass and right next to it have a very well designed drone port and see how many people go to eat there. That's one way you can test the success of a drone port in an African community, right? Thank you. So besides being woman-centric, um, there are some other elements we were looking at, including luminosity. Um, this level of illumination, we talked about the idea of, you know, can Juma Island glow at night? Would that be something that you could see maybe from once of this idea of a drone port that leverages its, its beaconness in a community through light, um, not just through the daytime, but through the nighttime where a lot of these rural communities might not have the power to illuminate their own households and it can become then a meeting place in the evening time. It must also be a catalyst. So a catalyst in terms of um, innovating all these new economic growth models that we kind of been hearing about that this could create, but also just opportunities like we were talking about with leveraging women in the community, leveraging the knowledge of the youth, all these things. It could, it could really become a catalyst in a sense. It could also be an incubator of new ideas. What has not been explored could be potentially explored at the drone port. If anything, it should be encouraged to be an incubator of new ideas that maybe just haven't reached the community yet or maybe someone in the community is looking to, to expand upon. And talking about safety, this, this civic space should be a space where the community feels safe and comfortable enough to be spending time there, invest the time and energy to really make it their own, but it's somewhere that they could seek safety as a, as a term um, in a more wholesome way. And then again, comfort. We want the community to feel comfortable here. Drones, to many, as we have heard, are still kind of new and foreign, and establishing a level of comfort could introduce that interest in the skill learning, interest in how, how they're operating, and then maybe expanding the whole economic model further. Yeah. Um, lastly, and one of the requirements for a civic space uh, is, is a very clear understanding of and studying the part in terms of the whole. Uh, and, and up to this far, you know, we've looked at the location of the drone port as one small trading center. But I'll challenge all of us to think about Juma Island as the site. Because when we begin to engage that terminology in that scale, then we begin to understand what impact it could potentially have on an island as a whole. You know, one of the most interesting and most powerful civic places in the world have very particular locations in a sense of where they are located. When you go to New York City, uh, the, the Central Park is clearly located in a precise location 
for a very particular purpose. When you visit uh, cities in Europe where the cathedral is located and the town hall are precisely located to have a very specific impact, right? And so to me, that's, that's something that any team that will get into the Lake Victoria Challenge should be challenged to really study the island as a whole and not just understand it from a trading center standpoint. So as we talked a little bit about comfort, this idea of the drone port offering actual shelter in terms of a very simple, just the idea of something overhead to make people feel safe, feel comfortable. Maybe as we got caught in the rain yesterday, we were offered shelter into many of these locals' homes and it was a wonderful experience. What if this could allow for that moment of interconnectivity within the community to happen? And, and, and shelter as, as a as a, not just a physical thing as well, but shelter as a, as a poetry terminology to describe the impact of what the drone port could be. Uh, and so shelter uh, means uh, safety. Shelter means I'm comfortable to share things that I'm not comfortable sharing. Uh, um, shelter means I can talk about the most awkward political situations in a place and not feel scared that, uh, it's going to turn out really bad. So shelter as a, a physical term, but also a metaphor and a poetry behind what this space could be is very, very important. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the guidelines for construction. A lot of the ideas we have been presenting are very abstract, but how, how do you actually build this? What are the guidelines for actual construction and feasibility? So I'm going to go through these really fast uh, so we have time uh, for questions and I would love to get out of here with more questions so that uh, people can really go think about uh, this thing. So like we talked about, uh, the materials need to be local. One of the things we observed yesterday at the island is a, one of the most available materials is the least utilized material on the island. And, and so that's very important for us to um, Thank you, I need a lot of help. Um, is the least utilized material, and so uh, that's something we need to, uh, to consider. And then uh, we need to also understand the life cycle of these materials and how best we can limit waste and increase uh, utilization of a very rich material uh, on the island. Uh, and then we have to challenge and think about is the drone port going to be something temporal or it's going to be permanent? Is this something that is going to change when drone technology changes in two years? Um, I mean, it's amazing for the, just the last three days, we moved from a very small drone to the Wild Food Program presentation of a spaceship that could carry probably three times as many people are, that are in this room, right? So it's going to change. Technology is going to change, and we need to uh, think, about, think about that. Uh, and then we need to think about enclosure on opacity. Uh, what does that mean in this context? And what does that mean in a context of allowing it to serve as a civic space as well as serve the uh, technical purposes that uh, it has to? And then local labor is something that is, is very important. Uh, to me, as part of the challenge for the Lake Victoria Challenge, is to really think about what additional skills can we bring to that community. And I would challenge any team to go into the community if they had to invent a new construction method, that that's something that needs to be replicable and deployable in multiple different dimensions on the island. And then training and development, again, as the process of construction needs to involve the local skilled uh, folks down there who have actually a lot more knowledge uh, than we can bring to the table for sure. Um, and then phasing and scalability, uh, we talked about having um, uh, a prototype built because the prototype, you know, we can spend a lot of time designing things and then you go out there, build it, and you quickly realize, no, actually, it, it, it can't work and it, it just won't work. And so we encourage to actually have a prototype to go out there, not only to test the structure strength of these things, but it also tests uh, the perception of the community of this thing that now you're introducing. So if the prototype sits out there for six months, 
it will give you a very good understanding whether this is something acceptable or it's just a really good idea. So I think uh, drone pods create just enormous opportunities. And to me, uh, it's just exciting to think about that we, as a community, as thinkers uh, in our different, uh, different fields, we could sit here and think about the possibilities in Africa, the possibilities of creating a new typology of what civic spaces are and how that could impact African communities as a whole. So again, I would say a drone port uh, is a place. It is not an object. It is not a building. Um, it is a place that people go to and have a good time. And then the drones, in my mind, are a supplement to the power of what civic spaces are. Now, this can't go without saying, Asante Sana. So I'd like to uh, open this up for some questions. Um, and we'll be glad to ask uh, somebody maybe to take some notes of these questions or keep track uh, of the questions. Thank you. Can I ask? Yeah, um, thank you so much. This was a um, very interesting uh, presentation. And I think you're spot on. The last few days, we've been doing a lot of flying on Juma Island. and. We actually set up a little structure that you would think of maybe, and, and some services, uh, and you can think of that already as a little drone port. It was uh, completely functional for us. Um, one or well, two comments. One is, um, have you thought about setting standards? Um, because right now, there's a lot of companies that are planning to have different modalities of uh, delivering uh, items and operating. And to what extent um, should we be sending setting a certain standard of how to do certain things, uh, what kind of UTM services should be set up, or should it be more of a plug and play, uh, you know, bring, bring your own module and um, set it up? Um, so I think that that's a very interesting uh, question going forward. And uh, second, uh, you said it has to be women-centric, and I, um, I see that and I completely agree. I'm talking about drones a lot at a lot of events, and I've made it a habit to count the women in the rooms, and it tends to be less than 5%. Um, and I would, <laughs> of most attendees, and I think it's a matter of uh, creating uh, an accepting space, and uh, also uh, it's a matter of mentorship, because we have a lot of uh, leaders in this room, very influential people, and I think it's important that, um, especially if you are male and have been given a position, that you start fostering and mentoring women as much as uh, men. And uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. That's just my two points. Yeah, I think that's, that's really good. I would like to uh, pick up something uh, to note. I think a lot of organizations in this room have power to design frameworks. Uh, and I think part of the challenge in developing countries uh, is that we spend a lot of time solving problems and very little time designing frameworks through which problems can be solved over time. Uh, and so that's, to me, that's very, very critical, that we cannot spend our time figuring out how to deliver something from one point to another without spending a lot of time to design the framework through which more problems in that regard could actually be solved. I really congratulate the team, the way they worked, and uh, was able to come with these very interesting uh, suggestions as of now. Certainly, we have to elevate a little bit the ideas that they have put across. And uh, very correctly, Joe is saying uh, the drone port is not the building, but the place. But the, also the place is different from a space. And therefore, that space needs to be articulated. And you cannot articulate the land itself, but the surroundings by providing the services and in so doing, you are creating the built environment of these structures. And now these structures are the ones actually going to define the, the drawing boards very well. And so I think architecturally, uh, the building surrounding now that place or the space is where to bring the knowledge of architecture 
to such that it becomes iconic to the passerby who are walking or even flying over. Now I was just wondering how actually we can integrate the land and the air. Because uh, the drone is something flying over and coming to land, on the land. And I was just thinking loud, can we have a space up there where the drone can come and land, like the helipad, some of the hotels we see bringing the hotels over the, hot, uh, the hotel roof, and that's it. So we could even think how we can integrate the land and the space up there above the structures that we are saying gonna articulate the space of the drone port which we thought of at the beginning, but we are elevating a little bit from there onwards. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good point. Um, I, I think everything will depend on, on the type of airframe and the performance of airframes. If you can imagine a wing copter or similar to a wing copter evolving, um, you know, to be a little bit larger and to be entirely as dependable as a Chinese motorbike, uh, then yes, you probably could have a tower structure, uh, but I, I'm not sure that um, that will be the final uh, design of uh, medium, small size cargo drones. Um, I just finished. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much to Joel and, and Daniela. You, you were up all night and uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think the, just the final point, what we're trying to do here is uh, it's a little bit mischievous, really. We're trying to game uh, the drone delivery business before the drone delivery business actually happens. And we're trying to game that industry on behalf of poorer communities who maybe have low margin goods to sell and, and don't have so much money to buy, but if you establish a network uh, which is sufficiently complex and interconnected and dependable, uh, then that the volume of goods being shipped on that network will be transformative, um, just as the mobile phone has proved to be uh, transformative in Africa. So uh, thank you so much. And a big shout out to Edward, actually. Thank you, since I'm on the stage. Uh, well done on everything. Um, and I just want to add one final point, which is Joel told me this morning that when he, he was a young boy in, uh, growing up in a, a very poor uh, community in Uganda, uh, the World Bank offered him a scholarship uh, to the United States. Three weeks, was it three weeks? Yeah, uh, and um, it transformed his life. Uh, so I think it's entirely appropriate, Joel, that the, that the World Bank is transforming your life again. Thank you.